Hey, this is Pastor John. Thanks so much for tuning in to either download or stream this study. Uh, we pray that this blesses you. There are a couple of things that we would like to lay before you quickly. Uh, number one is that you would consider this message supplemental in your walk with the Lord, that in no way would it replace either your being plugged into the church at the local church level or you listening to your local church pastor who has been charged with the care for your soul. Having said that, we do pray that um, this study of God's word would, would help you see and savor the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we would pray also that if, if this ministry blesses you, that you would prayerfully uh, consider supporting VXV. And if you do, you can do so by clicking on the link below or by going to our website at vxvchurch. Dot com. Now, I pray that God stirs your affections for Jesus Christ as you, as you dial into now the, the proclamation of God's word. Amen. Good morning, Verse by Verse Church. I hope you are well. Let's go ahead for the last time and open our Bibles to the book of Romans, so Romans chapter 15. <clears throat> we made it down to verse 30 the last time we were together. That is where we will pick it up today, Romans chapter 15 and verse 30. Now, uh, we've got four verses left in chapter 15, and then we come to the um, final chapter here in Romans, the 16th chapter, and we are going to endeavor... Uh, if we can, to bring our study in Romans to a close here this morning. And uh, it's a bit of a, a, a bittersweet sentiment, is it not? It's always difficult uh, to say goodbye to a journey like this one. And if you've read chapter 16, you sort of get the idea that it was difficult for the Apostle Paul as well. You've got a listing there. Um, where Paul sends farewell greetings to a minimum of some 35 individuals. This is a very lengthy list here. And, and so the temptation when we come to chapter 16 then is to kind of see this in such a way uh, that we're dealing with a, a kind of anticlimactic chapter, right? I mean, after all, we've just studied 15 chapters and arguably uh, the most important document in the history of the church and now here we are looking at chapter 16, and, and boy, it, it sure seems that Paul is having a real hard time saying goodbye to these people, right? Now, the truth be told, I don't see it that way at all. In fact, here's the way I see this, and, and I would encourage you uh, to look at chapter 16 through this lens as well. Uh, and if you think this through, ju just a beautiful focus here. After 15 chapters of fairly weighty heavy theology and application, Paul concludes this monster of an epistle with an extended focus on a whole host of individual human beings here, all right? Citing them, commending them, recognizing them, just loving on all these individuals here. There's a strong suggestion that there's a very pointed and deliberate emphasis here that you and I as individual human beings, we are remarkably valuable to our triune God. Now, understand if the Lord so chose in his sovereignty, right? I mean, you've got a beautiful four-verse prayer here at the end of chapter 15 that ends with, now may the God of peace be with you all, amen. If the sovereign Lord so chose, he could have just neatly and cleanly tied that whole deal off right there, right? And we'd be out, amen, now bye bye But that's not what he does, does he? Rather than that, God inspires Paul to write this beautiful, highly individualized exit here. You understand, right? 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is inspired by God. Like, all Scripture is God-breathed. And so what a fitting and beautiful and telling conclusion that this monster of an epistle, arguably the most profitable, powerful book in all the Bible, what a telling insight into the heart of our God that this massive treatise on the gospel that it ends with is brought 
home to resolves in a catalog of people, a compendium of individual human beings in the early church. The idea that all of this rich theology, this wonderful gospel, that that this is all ultimately for the objects of his affection, you and I, his children. This is wonderful. And so in this extended list here, not only are we given insight into God's heart for individual people, not only is that very powerfully put out there, but, but also we're going to be afforded significant insight into a number of very interesting characteristics here in the early church that, that I believe will be incredibly profitable for you and I. So, so I think we're in for a heck of a close here, and, and then we are going to mark it, punctuate it, if you will, by celebrating our Lord together through communion here at the end of the service. What a wonderful, wonderful journey uh, this has been for our extended church family here. Now, before we get to all that, however, before we get to that, uh, we've got uh, some powerful, wonderful text at the end of chapter 15 here. Very important text where Paul gives us tremendous instruction in this mission-critical area of prayer. All right, man, this is going to be so good. It's going to help you. And this will likely demand uh, the greater part of our time here this morning. So uh, I can't believe I'm saying this, but we get after it for the final time here in the book of Romans. Interestingly, I I realized this morning, 52 weeks in Romans, one exact year. So um, bittersweet, wonderful, wonderful journey. Let's get after it for the final time. We go to work now in verse 30 of chapter 15, verse 30. Now I urge you, underline that word urge. You might have appeal or beg or beseech there. I urge you, brethren, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together. We all have strive there. Underline that word strive. Very important, urge and strive. I urge you, brethren, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. And now he prays for three things here, okay? Number one, verse 31, that I may be rescued from those who are disobedient in Judea. First prayer. Second prayer, that my service for Jerusalem may prove acceptable to the saints. Third prayer, verse 32, so that I may come to you in joy by the will of God. Underline the will of God and find refreshing rest in your company. Now the God of peace be with you all Amen. Well, this is pure gold uh, in them, their hills here. And there's much here for us. Paul is urging us by way of invitation. Uh, he is urging by way of invitation that, that his brothers strive with him in prayer. And he's praying for three things here. Now, quick background check from last week so that we know what these prayers are coming off the back of. Okay. Uh, So here's what we've got. Again, Paul, in this epilogue, this final closing comments to the church here, he's been laying out his future plans for these guys. And and here they are with with great brevity here. Uh, Paul is on the final leg of his third uh, and final missionary journey, uh, depicted here by the yellow line. Uh, And he is going to be taking, you remember, this Gentile offering that he's collected from all these Gentile churches down to the believers in Jerusalem who are at the moment suffering under severe famine. Upon completing that mission, he then intends to make his way to Spain by way of Rome where he intends to camp out uh, with this church for some time in in order to enjoy, uh, no doubt, some some much-readed Uh, much needed rest in fellowship. Now, all three of these prayers here that we just read, they're going to be answered, but not exactly the way that Paul would have envisioned they would be answered, I would imagine, as is so often the case with you and I. But but here's what's interesting, and we'll get to that, but but here's what's very interesting. Here's what's revealing several things, really. Number one, here is the Apostle Paul And you remember from our time together last week, man, if anybody could get things done, it was this brother right here, right? From Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum, uh, this one-man evangelical wrecking crew took the gospel, you remember, to the entire Roman Empire. He said back in verses 19 and 23, 
There's nowhere left for me to go. I mean, I, I have canvassed the entire empire here. The gospel of Christ, he had, he had said in verse 23, stunning, has been fully preached. I mean, this guy is God's man of the hour, is he not? And he is no doubt, uh, no doubt about it, the greatest missionary that ever lived. Here is uh, uh, just uh, uh, the, the giant of the faith that God used to write the majority of our New Testament. I mean, he, Paul, he's just this force of God, and now he needs prayer. All right, this man needs prayer. This remarkable man of God. He's made his plans. He's charted his course. He's all ready to go. There's just one more thing. He needed prayer. And so look, man, it doesn't matter how high up you are in the spiritual food chain. I mean, you don't get any higher than the Apostle Paul. And yet, the best of men, well, they are men at best. He needed prayer. And so I think this speaks to the humility of the Apostle Paul. Now, I would venture a guess that if this mighty man of God was utterly dependent upon prayer, my guess is it's pretty safe to say that the likes of you and I ought to be as well. And and, and this is the thing um, about prayer, and Paul understood this. It takes a man of humility to recognize his dependence upon God, right? It takes a man or a woman of humility to put themselves out there for corporate prayer. That's what he's doing, right? Here's the thing, and man, this kills us. Pride will hinder you from getting the help you need, all right? It always amazes me, that despite asking the church to submit for prayer cards that we might serve them in this capacity. So few people do. And when they do, half the time it's left anonymously. Why is that? Because here's what we think. Oh, man, I mean, I don't want anybody to know I'm struggling here. And maybe I can slip a prayer and a prayer request in there, but, but I don't want anybody to know it's me, man. I got to keep that facade. I got to keep that veneer in place. And so there's just this insidious pride that, that keeps us from receiving the uh, uh, help from the willing hand of God. And then particularly when a person thinks, man, oh, I don't really need prayer. Do you understand the base pride in that? Right? What does God tell James to tell us. What does God tell Peter to tell us? That God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. First Peter 5, James 4, Job 22, right? Look, don't let familiarity inoculate you from the power of this truth. This is a mission critical spiritual principle here. God runs to the humble. Do you understand that? He just runs to that humble heart. He he delights in availing his power to such a heart, but he opposes the proud. Now, I don't know about you, but man, I, I do not want the God of the universe opposing me, all right? And so as powerful as a man that Paul was, he availed himself to corporate prayer here. And if we desire to have the kind of assistance that was rendered unto this man, well, then we would do well to simply humble ourselves and ask for prayer when we need it, particularly in this community of believers in which God has placed you, all right? Listen to me. The sooner you avail yourself to the spiritual reality, the sooner you're going to receive the power of God that is available unto you. Now, the second thing that we can tease out of verse 30 here, I think is super encouraging as well. A couple of Greek words that we need to unpack here. Uh, And again, if you're newer to VXV, uh, we don't look at these Greek texts to get all academic and lofty here, all right? But, But rather, we're looking at the original language of the Bible because the Hebrew in the Old Testament and the Greek in the New, all right, these languages are much more nuanced and much more colorful and colorful and layered than our English language is. And so while our English will oftentimes catch, capture an aspect 
of what the authors were originally communicating. So often we miss out on the richer uh, layers and meaning of the text. And, and I think most of you here get that. Now, two words here. I had you underline them both, all right? Two words, urge and strive. And in case you haven't picked up on this yet, when I have you underline a word, that usually means we're going to unpack it, all right? So urge and strive. Now, this word for urge, uh, again, you might have appeal or beg in your translation. I urge or appeal you, brothers, by the Lord Jesus Christ. This word for appeal here, uh, this is the Greek word parakaleo, okay? And it, and it means literally to call to one side. It means to invite, and it carries a sense of urgency to it. I, I would call this parakaleo an urgent invitation, all right? And so Paul is literally inviting this church. He is saying, I am extending to you an urgent invitation to strive with me in prayer. Now, this word for strive here, Right here in verse 30 is the only time we see this word in the New Testament. And, and it's pretty fun to say. It right? sounds like something you'd hear at a sumo wrestling match, right? Suganizamai. Okay. Uh, it, it's just kind of fun to say. Uh, Suganizamai. And it's a very muscular word there. And, and now, Suganizamai, this is a word that is taken out of the world of athletics. Okay. It's an athletic term, and it was used in this culture to speak of the energy that an entire team would put forward collectively in order to gain victory. The word literally means to struggle collectively for a prize. Sunegonizomai, to struggle collectively for a prize. And the root word here, which is agonizomai, it's where we get our word agonize from, and so there's, a, there's a, a laborious kind of um, work element to this word here. It, it's the soon part, soon agonism. The soon prefix there adds the kind of collective team intensity to it. So very complex, very rich, layered word that Paul chooses here. But it's very insightful, insightful man, important that we get this if we want to grab this here. So Paul is saying to this church, look, brothers, we are on the same team here, right? We're on the same team, and I am extending to you an urgent invitation to be a part of this work. I, I need you to strive with me in prayer. I'm about to walk into the lion's den here. Would you pray with me and for me? Okay, so Paul is calling his team to, to go to work in prayer. Now, this ought to be, um, I, I would think, incredibly encouraging to you and I, uh, and, and yet also in another sense, fairly challenging. And, and let me unpack that. The encouraging piece is this. Paul is inviting these guys, parakaleo. He is inviting these guys to be a part of the work that God is accomplishing, accomplishing through him. Now dial in here. As this church was praying for the Apostle Paul, and God is using the Apostle Paul to accomplish incredible things. Who do you suppose is going to share in the eternal rewards but those that were praying for him? Don't miss this, man. Look, read 1 Corinthians 3, read John 4. Some will plant, some will water, some will pray, some will harvest, some will add here, another there. But all of us are a part of and unified in God's kingdom purposes. And we will all share in those rewards where we have plugged into the team. So Paul's urgently inviting this church here at Rome to agonize in prayer with him that they might share in what it is that God accomplishes. Now, the implications of this are massive. I mean, just massive. In other words, you might become, for example, um, aware of some missionary team that's going to Indonesia. Now, maybe you can't be part of that team, but you can strive in prayer with them and for them and be a part of what God accomplishes there in both kind and reward. The, the implications are massive, or, or to bring it closer to home, because we want to model after this as well. There are many of you who pray with me and for me in the proclamation of God's word here every Sunday morning. Those of you who are doing that, man, thank you. 
and be encouraged. The Bible says you will be a huge part of and, and rewarded for whatever work it is that God chooses to accomplish um, here. Now, let me share this with you, uh, and I should do this more often. We get this stuff all the time, um, but just this last week, res- we received this uh, from the other side of the planet, okay? This says, um, hi, I can't thank God enough to, to show me this website, but then I don't even remember how I came across this website, but this is crazy. I mean, I can't stop thinking about wanting to know more about Jesus, I'm listening to Genesis chapter 6 in your study, and I'm already dot, dot, dot. I had no idea God is so amazing. I laugh, I cry, I fear, I repent while listening to these studies. But this is crazy. God is answering to all my questions through these studies. I mean, sometimes I just want to shout and tell the people around me to listen to these studies in capital letters, no, God. God is the only treasure. What was I doing all these years? I wish I had listened to God 10 years ago when he was continually warning me, like literally 10 years, maybe more, I don't know, but I'm, I'm too distracted by how amazed I am now to even worry about the wasted years. I mean, I don't know if I should force myself to listen to the whole study since I'm eager to listen to the rest or just pause the video and just break out and praise about God because when I do, I lose track of time. And I'm like, how am I going to contain this awesomeness of God in the future? And, and how am I going to, some of this ought to rub off on us, right? And how am I going to contain or survive the awesomeness of God when he becomes more and more real to me? I have no idea. How do people survive this? Honestly, thank you, thank you, thank you. Sunjiha, Bangalore, India. And she just sort of goes on there, but you get the point. Listen, God, in Australia, God has really begun to move on the world stage from this tiny little corner of the world in Three Rivers. And you are a part of that. You are to share in the rewards of that as you plug yourself into this team. And so, so we take our example from Paul here. Look, look, we covet your prayers. We need your prayers. Would you pray with us and for us in this ministry of the word, particularly its global impact? And so look, be encouraged, man. This is a wonderful, massive principle that Paul is introducing to us here. Now, the, the, so, so that's the encouraging piece of this. The challenging piece is this. Suganizomai, striving, labor. All right? There ought to be from time to time a real laborious aspect to our prayers, right? That, that, uh, that, that this kind of... Um, agonizing in prayer together that Paul's talking about here. Now, not all prayers have this dynamic to them. We understand that, right? There are prayers of thanksgiving. There are prayers of praise that that flow just very effortlessly out of our delight in God. There are different modes of prayer that don't necessarily involve this kind of um, agonizing, striving, battle dynamic. But there are other matters in the Christian experience where clearly we are called to a kind of battle prayer, right? You remember Jesus said, this one only comes out by prayer and fasting, right? Matthew 17, talking about this demon messing with this kid. And you remember back in the Old Testament, uh, uh, Exodus chapter 17, the Amalekites are, are attacking Israel. Moses tells Joshua, go, go grab some men, go out to the battlefield and fight these guys. Uh, Aaron, her, you boys come with me. We're going to the top of the hill, and I'm going to get after the Lord in prayer. Now, wonderful imagery in that story. You can get that in our study in Exodus 17 if you want to go back and get that. But um, uh, one of the fascinating pictures in that text is that Moses, he's no spring chicken there, right? He gets tired of holding up his staff in the air in prayer there. And then Aaron and her, like, like they have to physically help the guy, like one guy on each arm. They're, they're literally holding Moses's arms up for him. What's fascinating about that text is whenever Moses' arms were up, Israel is conquering their adversaries. Whenever Moses' Moses's arms dropped, the battle started swinging in the other direction, and the Amalekites would get the upper hand. And so that's why uh, the text tells us these two other men had to come alongside Moses and physically hold him up. The picture is that of laborious intercession, 
The text says that they did that till sunset. And as a result, Joshua and the boys routed the Amalekites. Now, there are a whole host of other passages we could cite here, like, like Jacob wrestling with God in Genesis 32. I mean, there are many others. And the point is this. Look, there are times when you and I are called to a kind of battle prayer where there's a kind of striving and, and laboring going on where we're, we're just pouring out our hearts to God. And, and I'm afraid a number of us, either we just don't understand this or, or we don't press into this kind of battle prayer that, that needs to find its place in our Christian experience of prayer, right? Because this is the kind of prayer that gets things done. And this now is the kind of prayer that Paul is asking his brothers to to, uh, um, get after here with him. Listen, man, prayer, if it's one thing that we take for granted, it might just be this, most of all, that prayer is just this blessed, do we understand that blessed, holy, sacred, unique, divine privilege through which God is allowing his children, like, I, I don't even get this full access to his throne all the time. Do you understand that? You have 24-7 access to the throne room of the God of the universe. So often I believe we forget just what it costs God to secure that blessed privilege. It cost him his son. This is not something to be taken lightly, guys. In other words, you don't just sit there in bed at night and say to the Lord with a yawn, Oh, I pray now for world peace, amen. And then, you know, roll over and go to sleep. Well, we understand that is a lazy prayer, right? I mean, there is no genuine striving there. Now, I've exaggerated to make a point. I don't think any of us here are quite so cavalier. But And, and most of you, I, I think you know this, right? Maybe we haven't put words to it. Maybe, maybe we don't have a category, category for it in our minds. But, but most of you, you've experienced this, right? Like there are times when, when man, it's just tough to strive and contend in prayer. Like you've got a loved one. They're in real trouble. And, and, and when you're praying for them, right, like you feel that, don't you? And you, you just exp- you, you bear the weight of that when you're going to God in prayer. It, it is a battle, Is it not? And that is what Paul is asking for here. There is spiritual work involved. And and might I add, and this is true of every church I know of, that that the prayer meetings in most churches are the least attended ministries. You want to know why? Because there's real spiritual work going on there. How, How I wish this were not so. Now, Not only then does Paul call our attention to sharing in the rewards of striving prayer, but notice he also shows us here, again, it's not God save the world, amen, right? But notice he shows us here that prayer is to be very specific. Paul is praying for three things very specifically here, and this is exactly what we see in the prayers of the saints in the New Testament, particularly the high priestly prayer of our Lord himself in John 17. What we see in the pages of Scripture is that the prayers of the people of God are very targeted, right? Very specific prayers. And so I've always maintained and have always counseled folks, look, man, Dial down in your prayers. Target your prayers. Ask the Lord very specifically. Now, notice the three things that Paul is asking for here. Okay? And kind of having the history and the background behind us. Wonderful insights, man. Wonderful profit for you and I here. Notice he prays for three things here. And and notice they're all separated by the word that. Okay? Here they are that I may be rescued from those who are disobedient in Judea. First prayer. That my service for Jerusalem may prove acceptable to the saints, so that I may come to you in joy by the will of God and find refreshing rest in your company. Now, number one, he said that, uh, he, he prayed that he would be rescued from those who are disobedient. All right? Now, this word for disobedient, some of you have the word unbelievers there. This is the Greek word apatheo, all right? 
It's where we get our word apathy from, but this word in the Greek considerably stronger. This word apatheo, it means to refuse belief. Literally, in the Greek lexicon, it means the condition of being unpersuadable. All right? And so there are, and look, there are people in your life, right? It doesn't matter what they see. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what you do. They are not going to be persuaded. Paul knows that he's heading into the lion's den here, and he is going to be dealing with the very same people that the Lord Jesus Christ himself stood before. Now, if a person is not persuaded in the presence of Jesus... That is a person that the Father is not drawing unto salvation, John 6, 44. And so Paul knew, look, not a thing I can do about these unpersuadable men, all right? So uh, would you pray for me to be delivered from these guys, uh, protected from these guys, rescued from these guys? That's prayer one. Second thing he prays for, That their service, that his service would be acceptable. Now, now he's talking about, uh, again, the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem uh, favorably receiving this offer from the Gentile service. Paul's service here is speaking of this Gentile offering he's taking to Jerusalem. Now, this is sometimes a very hard thing for people to do, isn't it? Right? I mean, it can be a humbling thing. And some of us, we're in touch with this emotion, aren't we? You're in a tough season. You're just in a difficult spot in life. You need money or some such resource. There is a person willing to provide that for you, uh, but oftentimes pride just prevents us from taking it, right? That's what Paul's after here. Pray for these guys to humbly accept this offering on behalf of the Gentiles. And then the third thing uh, that he prays for, he says that I may come to you by the will of God. Now, the will of God, very, very important to this man. You remember he said this in, um, well, all the way back in chapter 1. Always in my prayers making requests, if perhaps at last now, if perhaps now at last, by the will of God, I may succeed in coming to you. And and look at all of how Paul opens up every one of his letters. It's always Christ, uh, the Apostle Paul, a slave, bond slave of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. Every letter, this guy is dialed into pursuing hard after the will of God. And what he said in chapter 1 there, it's the exact same thing he's saying here in verse Verse 32, he is praying that he would come to these guys by the will of God. Now, why is it important that we pray the will of God? Well, because John said in 1 John 1, right? Look, if we, if we will, do we got that there? John said in 1 John 5, you remember this, um, if we will... Um, Just pray in harmony with the will of God, right? If we will pray in harmony with the will of God, verse 14, he hears us. And if he hears us, verse 15, well, we're going to receive the answer to our prayer. So prayer, look, let me put it to you this way, but prayer... Friends, understand, but prayer is not a sales job where I'm somehow trying to sell, uh, I'm somehow trying to sell God on my great ideas. Now, now, come on, God, I got some good ideas here, man. Now, if you could just get behind this deal and bring it to pass, that would be awesome. No, no. Rather, biblical prayer, according to the word of God, is where God is bending me to accept his will. Prayer is where God is beginning to align my will to to come into line with his. Prayer is not a vehicle to get our will done here on earth, but prayer is where you and I are pleading to God that his will would come to pass because daddy knows best. And, And that's what the apostle Paul is pleading for here. Now, here's what I find incredibly intriguing here. If you have read the narrative in the book of Acts, 
you understand that the Apostle Paul is completely missing the timing here. All right, as you read through the latter half of Romans 15, you get the distinct impression. Just look at this text. You get the distinct impression that here's the Apostle Paul. It's just going to be boom, boom, boom. All right, now now I've collected this money. I'm going to head down to Jerusalem for a couple of days. I don't know, maybe a week. I'm going to do some business there in Jerusalem, drop off the dough, then I'm going to turn right around and head for you guys up there in Rome. I will see you in very short order. At the time of this writing, there is no evidence whatsoever in the text here that Paul even appears to have the first clue that he is going to end up forcefully stalled in the greater Jerusalem area there for over two years. Now, if the great, this should encourage you, man, if the great apostle Paul missed the timing of God here, Why in the world are you and I so shocked when we miss the timing of God? If it is very clear in the scripture that the likes of the Apostle Paul can miss the timing of God, it is fairly safe to assume that you and I are going to be doing quite a bit of that ourselves. Now, did God, though, did did God answer the prayers of the Apostle Paul here? Yes, he most certainly did. All three of them, every one of them, though no doubt not exactly the way Paul perhaps had envisioned that he would. Was he delivered from the unpersuadable men? Yes, he was delivered. How was he delivered? Well, Over 40 of these unpersuadable men had taken a vow not to eat or drink until they killed the guy. They were lying in wait, prepared to ambush him. Now, by God's providence, the Romans got a wind of that plot there in Jerusalem, and there in the middle of the night, Paul was personally delivered to Caesarea by two centurions, 200 soldiers, another 200 spearmen, and 70 horsemen. Acts 23. I would suggest to you that that prayer for deliverance was answered rather dramatically. Did the believers in Jerusalem receive the Gentile offering? Well, yes, they did. But again, not not before uh, they marched Paul through this kind of weird, week-long legalistic trip where they they essentially had him put a kind of ceremonial dog and pony show there in the temple, Acts 21. But, But you know what? They received the offering, and prayer number two was answered. Now, did Paul make it to Rome? Well, yes, he did. All expenses paid, as a matter of fact, but he arrived by shipwreck and snake bite, where he would spend two years under house arrest there in Rome. But the Roman government expressly allowed the people of the church there in Rome to visit him and take care of him. And so God answered that prayer as well. And the fascinating thing in the answer to this third prayer is, as the providence of God would have it, Paul wrote four epistles that appear in our New Testament from that Roman prison. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, all produced in that Roman prison under the sovereign orchestration of the hand of God, just working behind the scenes and ordering Paul's life according to his perfect will. And who do you suppose is going to share in the rewards of those four incredible accomplishments, but those in Rome who were striving in prayer with and for the Apostle Paul. Would you like to have a piece of that reward, right? Colossians, Ephesians, Philemon, right? Philippians. Now, if we are praying in harmony with the will of God... Friends, understand, God is going to be answering our prayers in spectacular fashion as well. And yet, not quite the way that we might think he will, 
and not quite in the time frame that we would like him to. But this much we can be assured of beyond a shadow of a doubt, right? James, in him there is no shadow of turning. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, this much we know that God will accomplish his will and the answering of our prayers in his perfect way, in his perfect time. And whether that's here or in eternity, we will discover that he has done exceedingly abundantly above all that we could have ever thought or hoped for or asked for. That's Ephesians 3.20, which, of course, we got from that Roman prison. Boom. Oh, beloved man, avail yourself to prayer. Avail yourself to prayer and experience the hand of God in your life. All right. Now, as we begin to make our way, uh, turning the page here through chapter 16, again, we've got a long list of names here. We're going to read through the whole chapter. We'll make some color commentary along the way, then we'll come back and try to, to tease out some, some observations here. But as we're making our way through the text, uh, I want to give you a couple of things to look for, okay, to kind of keep an eye on, kind of a heads up. I want you to notice and look for terms of affection, And I want you to look for terms of service. These are two things that characterize the early church that we would do well to notice. So let's get after this list, and then we're going to come back and circle the wagons in a bit here. This is awesome. Verse 1 of chapter 16. Verse 1. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, uh, whose name means bright and happy, by the way. I thought you'd like to hear that wherever you are. Yeah, all right. Uh, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant. Now, that word servant is diakonos. It's where we get our word deacon from. Uh, Our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, which is at Sancria. Now, Sancria was a port city about nine miles east of Corinth. Uh, And and Phoebe here, she is the woman. uh, That's where she, the church to which she ministered to primarily. But she was the woman that Paul selected to hand deliver this letter that Paul wrote to the Romans from Corinth, obviously very trustworthy woman to be entrusted with the, the, the personal messenger, uh, messenger duties of this remarkable document. So, so great, great lady here. Here's what he says about her in verse 2. Uh, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and that you help her in whatever matter she may have need of you. For she herself has also been a helper of many and of myself as well. So very warm commendation here. For Phoebe, verse 3. Now, we recognize these guys, right? Greet Prissa and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who for my life risked... There's a great early church word right there. For, for my life risked their own necks, uh, to whom not only do I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. And also greet the church that is in their house. Greet Epineatus. Uh, now, notice the affection here. My beloved who was the first convert to Christ from Asia. Verse 6, greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. Now, um, Priscilla and Aquila, uh, we know a little bit about these two. Let's just stop for a minute. Um, They met the Apostle Paul probably by way of profession uh, there in the city of Corinth. Initially, they had been, um, there was a, in Rome, uh, the the Caesar had all the Jews kicked out of, there was a dispersion there. They go to Corinth. They meet Paul. They were of the same trade, uh, tent makers, leather workers. Uh, Many believe that they came to Christ under Paul's ministry. We do know that they trained for him, uh, trained with him for about two years uh, by moving on. uh, before Paul moved on to Ephesus, this couple, Prissa and Aquila, uh, by the way, Luke calls her Priscilla. Did I say that already? Okay, so Luke had called her Priscilla. But this power couple was best known, all right, for having taught the great Old Testament teacher Apollos in the ways of the gospel, Acts 18. Notice he calls them fellow workers. Now, verse 6 there, we don't know who this Mary is. Very common name, though, in the first century. But notice that he says there, look at verse 6 with me, that she worked hard. Underline that, worked hard. This is the Greek word kopiao, and it means to work to the point of exhaustion. Okay? Now, there's a lot of workers and helpers in this list, but there are only four people, we'll see the rest of them, 
down in, what is it, verse 12. There are only four people to whom Paul ascribes such a description, and they are all women. Uh, So, guys, yeah, evidently not a lot has changed. Now, verse 7. (laughs) Greet Andronicus and Junus, my kinsmen and fellow prisoners, who are outstanding among the apostles, who were also in Christ before me. These are fellow prisoners and Jews who evidently had a very good uh, reputation among the apostles. Greet Ampliatus, notice, my beloved, there it is again, in the Lord. Ampliatus is a slave name. Uh, Verse 9, here's an interesting pair here. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and Stachys, not Stacy, but Stachys, my beloved. Now, Urbanus, interesting, this name means of the city. Urbanus means, in the Greek, of the city. It means urbane. And then his his cohort here, Stachys, uh, this this means ear of corn. Like, I'm thinking if your name's corn on the cob, you were probably born out in the country here, right? And so, so how, how, we got the inner city guy and in the corn on the cob here. Guy. So great diversity there. I just think that's interesting. Uh, verse 10, greet Apelles, the approved in Christ. Greet those who are of the, notice, household of Aristobulus. So, so don't greet Aristobulus, but greet those, greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my kinsman. Greet those uh, of the household of Narcissus, uh, not this guy, was into himself, um, uh, who are in the Lord. Now, now notice there, um, Aristobulus and Narcissus were two wealthy, very influential people in Caesar's government. And yet they themselves, Paul's not saying they are Christians, but he's saying members of their household have become Christians there in the church at Rome. Very interesting, right? Now, verse 12, uh, greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, just a, an adorable little pair here. These are two ladies. Uh, uh, Tryphena, her name means dainty, and Tryphosa in the Greek means delicate. So you've got dainty and delicate. And, and then notice, workers in the Lord. So also, kopiao. So these guys, dainty and delicate, also work to the point of exhaustion. It doesn't matter what you are in the physical, you can be mighty in the Lord, right? So don't be defined by your cover or your characteristics. These dainty and delicate here were mighty workers in the Lord. Greet Persis, the beloved. Now, Persis, that's a Persian name, so this is a Persian gal. But notice what's so interesting here. Four times Paul says, greet my beloved. But when he mentions the one woman here that that he ascribes beloved to, he says, greet the beloved. You see, Paul is very sensitive to, to not put out the appearance of evil there, right? He's, he's very sensitive in how our ministry, a, a, a man's ministry with women ought to be. He, he calls her the beloved so that nobody would misunderstand. Are you with me? Very fascinating detail. I hope some of you are grabbing that. Uh, so uh, 13, greet Rufus, chapter, uh, verse 13. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord. Um, so Rufus was the first Calvinist in the church at Rome, right? Rufus, chosen in the Lord. Some of you get that. Some of you don't. And also his mother and mine. This is not Paul's biological mother, uh, but she was rather a kind of mother to him. Verse 14. Greet a syncretus uh, who set his watch with uh, Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobas, Hermas, and the brethren with them. They all had the same time there. Uh, verse 15. Greet Philologus and Julia. A uh, very interesting name here, Philologus. Philo, love, logos, word. So, so his name means lover of the word, right? Awesome, also a slave name, but a lover of the word. Uh, Nerus and his sister and Olympus and all the saints who are with them. And greet, verse 16, greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, don't be doing that here, all right? And you can pat me on the back, go for the fist bump, right? I don't care what you do, but don't be coming in for the holy kiss, all right? And I don't want to see the rest of you making out in the church lobby either. Now, uh, in this culture, um, they would kiss each other on the cheek after not having seen one another for an extended period of time. The reason they called it a holy kiss was to distinguish it from a sexual kiss or a a hypocritical kiss. Think Judas, okay? So now, you you people see each other every week, so uh, no, no holy kissing going on here now. So, 
Yeah. <laughs> greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. Now, so, so notice we have all this charity, right? All, all this loving familial language being used here. And now suddenly, right out of the blue, verse 17, Paul seems to be just switching gears without popping the cl- like Almost like he's changing the subject. But is he? Verse 17. Now, I urge you, brethren, keep your eye or watch out in your translation, right? Uh, Mark in your translation. I urge you, brothers, keep your eye on those who cause dissension and hindrances, hindrances contrary to the teaching which you have learned. In other words, false teaching. So what are we to do about those people? Well, notice, turn away from them. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. And notice, by their smooth and flattering speech, they what? Deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. That word for unsuspecting, it means the simple. It means the naive, all right? Verse 19, for the report of your obedience, Roman church, has reached to all. So the third time that Paul has just commended this church, right? The report of your obedience has reached to all. Therefore, I am rejoicing over you, but I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. The God of peace, verse 20, will soon crush Satan under your feet. So notice Paul is linking these false teachers to Satan. He is saying they are energized by the evil one. All right. Now, discernment and false teaching, this is something that you guys have had a lot of instruction in, not because we're heresy hunters, we're not, but because the Bible teaches polemically against false teaching in every book in the New Testament. We teach what the text teaches. Now, given that, however, given this body's experience in this area, we'll limit this discussion to the two main points Paul is mentioning here. I don't know, maybe add a little bit of color commentary and we'll move on down the road. Now, so, so here's Paul closing out his letter, and he wants these guys to dial into two simple commands concerning these false teachers. By the way, guys, let me say this one more time. Paul's saying, we're going to close the letter. Two things that you need to do concerning false teachers. What are they? Well, they are these. Here's the ESV translation. I, th- I think it clarifies these two issues well. So two commands, very simple. Watch out for them and avoid them, right? Pretty simple. Here in my NASB, keep your eye out for them and turn away from them. Now, two additional things here quickly because Paul makes them explicit in this text, right? Uh, Now, notice they seem to be real nice guys, don't they? Boy, these guys, they are, whoa, you know, hey, hey, smooth talk and flattery. They, They are... Very pleasant on the surface. Guys, understand, false teachers don't get a following by being cruel or harsh. Do you get that? False teachers get a following by being nice. All right? Well, that sounds, if people are reading it, well, that sounds pretty good. Boy, what are you saying there sounds good? Oh, I like that there. Number two, who do they deceive? All right, who do they deceive? Well, the naive, of course, right? Those who do not know the word of God well enough to defend themselves. So the command here, and you got to go back to chapter 14, the command is for the strong brothers and sisters, right? Strong brothers, strong sisters, it is on you to protect the weaker brothers, to protect the naive among you. Watch out for these guys, mark them out, identify them, and then get that garbage out of your assembly. Now, I, for one, Do not believe this is out of place at all here, and evidently either does the Apostle Paul. Why? Because to love one another well means to protect one another. Right now, kids, don't the little kids get mad when mom and dad are trying to protect them? Get over it, kid. This is for your best, right? Now, to love one another well means to protect one another. Moms and dads, do you not seek to protect your children? Of course you do. 
Are they going to get mad at you sometimes? Of course they are. Buck up. Right? We, we do the right thing. And so in the mind of the Apostle Paul, part of this loving, affectionate, familial care that's on display here, part of this needs to be, must be, protecting our family from deception. Now, I understand this is not real popular in this kind of soft, sappy um, American church culture that is largely capitulated to this kind of tolerant relativism, like we worship at the altar of tolerance, and oh, it's evil. Boy, you are... Look, we have to be faithful, okay? Love guards. Love protects, right? Love stands on a wall and takes up a weapon, and that weapon is the spirit of the, the spirit of the, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, Ephesians six seventeen. So we need to lovingly do this. This is an act of love. It fits perfectly in this chapter in the mind of the apostle Paul. All right. Finally, then uh, this morning, verse twenty one. Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you as do Lucius and Jason and uh, Sosipater and my kinsmen. Now we know who Timothy is, right? Uh, Paul's protege, he writes the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy t- to uh, this guy. Now, uh, all these people from here on out in these next three verses, these are not people in the church in Rome, but these are people who are serving alongside Paul at Corinth from which he's writing this letter, okay? So I, Tertius, his name means a third. Uh, he is the scribe to which Paul dictated this letter. I, Tertius, who write this letter, greet you in the Lord. Verse 23, Gaius, Paul stayed at this guy's house. A host to me and to the whole church greets you. Erastus, uh, the city treasurer, greets you. Quartus, uh, his name means fourths or quarters. Uh, kind of wild kid in college. Um, the brother, uh, verse 24, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now, verse 25, at this point, Paul picks up the pen and writes these last three verses in his own hand. We learned that in 2 Thessalonians 3, that this was his custom in all of his letters. Why Paul didn't write, we don't know. Was he thinking? Did he have a a physical impediment? But he used a scribe, but would always close it by the pen of his own hand. So he says, Now, to him who was able to admonish you, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, and by this he means the unification of Jew and Gentile coming together in Christ, okay, uh, which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all nations, leading to obedience of the faith. Again, notice Paul links the gospel in obedience is, is synonymous to the wise, the only wise God through Jesus Christ. And here's how he ends the whole shooting match. Notice, be the glory forever. Wow, what a book. Makes me want to pause and sit down and cry like a girl. Uh, How how fitting um, that Paul should end this remarkable epistle by paying homage to the glory of God. Now, I think if we've been paying attention here, there are a number of things to be discerned in the reading of the 16th chapter. I think there are a couple of compelling realities that are presented in the text that that kind of feed into a a larger and greater definition of of how this early church operated. so, so, So let's look at a couple of those realities quickly. Number one, this was a very diverse church, all right? Incredibly diverse group of individuals, now, Rome at its zenith had an upwards of five, six million slaves in the empire. Now, we have to be very careful not to write our civil history over this. Very, very different. These were generally people that volunteered uh, into these extended employment contracts because of severe financial hardship. Very different. But in this list here, we've got several names that were typically given to slaves. Ampliatus, Urbanus, Hermes. Uh, Philologus and Junia, very likely Roman slave names. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you've got Christians from the houses of Aristobulus and, and Narcissus, very wealthy, very connected individuals in the upper stratum of Roman society. So in this church at Rome here, understand, as we've walked through this, right, you've got rich and poor, male and female, Jew and Gentile, slave and free, 
urbanites and country bumpkins, right? I mean, this is one remarkably diverse group of individuals, and I believe this is held up for you and I as a kind of model. It shows you and I that, look, God is no respecter of persons, right? Romans 2.11, God shows no partiality. There is to be no partiality afforded to any one individual over another. We are all one in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3.28 describes this um, perfectly. I can't believe I'm still on that slide there. All right, so here's this. Is this not the church in Rome? There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free man, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. That describes this group of people right here beautifully. And so look, the one point is here, look, look man, the, the gospel is the great equalizer of men and women. Right? The gospel is the great equalizer equalizer. We, have, we are all of equal value in the body of Christ, and therefore there is no room for boasting of any kind. And so we ought to be very careful how we order our lives here under the smokescreen of pride. The gospel is the great equalizer, man. Now, also, what diversity does uh, for a church is, is diversity equips a church with a very wide array of spiritual gifts. Very, very healthy for a church to have diversity. This church here in Rome certainly did. Second thing, second thing I find interesting here. And we see this all over the scriptures. The second thing that's intriguing is the elevation of women in the body of Christ. The very first two people mentioned here in this list are prominent women in the early church. And again, there are only four individuals flattered with this description, copiao, a very hard worker, and they are all women. And then notice in verse 3 here that Priscilla's name precedes Achilles, right? Four of the six times this couple is mentioned in the New Testament, her name is first. Now, there are some who suggest she may have had the more prominent ministry in the church. There are others who simply suggest she had the more domineering personality in the marriage. And, of course, we've all seen plenty of that, right, particularly in the Shank household, right? Uh, At any rate, here in chapter 16, as well as in the... I told you I was going to throw his anger your way. All right. Uh, Here in chapter 16... Reel it back in. Here in chapter 16, as well as the New Testament, right? It was a woman to whom Jesus first revealed himself as the Messiah, John 4. It was a woman of whom first carried the news of the resurrection, John 20. We could go on. And it is a woman who tops the list here in chapter 16, the very person that was chosen to carry this letter to Rome. Now, I don't know where, I don't know how, I don't know when, but somewhere down the line, the church got this reputation that is ridiculous reputation, the reputation that we view our women as barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen and all of this business. I don't know what Bible these people are reading, but what I see in the Bible is that unlike every other world religion, wherever Christianity has gone out into the world, in its wake has been the liberation and elevation of women. Amen? And, and particularly in a culture where this was not so. Now, there are some other things I think that could no doubt be mentioned here, but, but ultimately what they all feed into uh, is this. As I said at the onset, that very deliberate, very potent way to end this remarkable treatise on the gospel we call Romans, right? One of the things you've no doubt noticed here, okay? This is just beautiful to me. One of the things you've no doubt noticed is how Paul is using just the explicit language of family here, right? Brothers, sisters, mothers. He calls them beloved, fellow workers, kinsmen. 
This chapter is just soaked in the language of affection and, and just saturated with terms of, of tenderness and, and genuineness. And, and then the descriptors themselves paint a compelling picture, don't they? Guys, don't miss this. You've got received, served, commended, right, risked. You've got lovers of the word, approved, worked hard. I mean, if you take a look at all of this together here, man, you have got one heck of a picture of a church here, don't you? And it's why for the third time now, Paul just elevates this group of believers here in verse 19. Look, look, the report of your obedience has reached all. I rejoice in you people. This is an awesome church. Would to God that the Lord and our community could say the same thing for the likes of our churches today. Something to shoot for, isn't it? Now, um, at the end of the day, What Romans 16 just screams to you and I is that Paul is making it very, very clear here that what is important and what is to be the chief business of the church, it is to be people. All right? It is people. People are the most important thing in the church. This is what we must get back to. Now, what we have done with the church in the West here in our day is we have made the organization the most important thing. We have made the the promotion and the, the perpetuation of our brand of Christianity the most important thing. We are running people over. We are manipulating people and cloaking that in good. We have, in fact, I, I I hate to say this, but, but what the church, the, the, not we, you, us here, but what the church has done in far too many cases for far too long, conce- it, 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 we have concealed crimes against children by these pedophile priests for decades. And it's not just the Catholic church. There have been a number of issues in the Protestant world as well. Not those issues, but other issues. Now, why would we do that? Why would we conceal? To protect the brand to promote the organization. We have to, what we have to ask ourselves very soberly, I think, is is why in the world would the church at large do what it has done over the last several decades? I mean, why would the church do these things? And I would suggest to you, it is because we have valued the business of the church much more than the people of the church. It is because by and large, we are far more concerned with the protecting and the promoting and the perpetuating of our brands and our organizations than we have the precious individual people whom the church exists to love, nurture, care for, and disciple. Our organization is not the most important thing. Our brand is not the most important thing. People made in the Imago Dei, in the image of God, they are the most important thing. That then brings us to communion. Communion. 